All right, we all know the score. Let's round out this short Koji Shiraishi retrospective with a look at one of his more recent projects. As you may have already guessed, this one is another found footage film, the genre which has by now come to define Shiraishi's career. Today's subject, Cult, was released in 2013, four years after Occult, itself seeing release four years after Noroi. And yes, that's Cult, not to be confused with Occult. This time around, we're dealing with what appears to be a somewhat similar premise, yet which is in actuality quite different from the earlier film, Occult. We begin the film following a director who initially takes part in the film's proceedings. In this case, rather than approaching individuals about supernatural phenomena around town, our director is filming an interview with a trio of young actors who sign up for a reality television project. In this case, little do they know, but the young women are biting off more than they can chew. Once they agree to participate, we learn that the program in question is a reality show where they will be sent to examine a haunted house. This presents us with one of the first differences between Cult and Shiraishi's earlier found footage movies. We are shown more cramped spaces as in the other films, though this time it's not all handheld cameras. As one might expect of such a program, we have security camera style footage as well, with stationary shots around the haunted estate. What's more, Cult presents us with a tonal divergence from Occult and Noroi, that being the presence of more comedic elements. Unintentional or not, there are more than a few moments of utter hilarity which appear as a product of some peculiar acting. Additionally, the cast of Cult doesn't feel as fleshed out as those in Noroi nor Occult. What's more, the soundtrack and atmosphere of the film aren't as pulse-pounding, instead allowing the comedy to play off the horror. The horror itself is presented differently as well, where prior films would have interviewees explaining past events and perhaps providing grainy, short pieces of footage to amplify their stories, Cult is chock full of CGI haunts, with tons more time spent showing rather than telling about the supernatural elements of the film. In this way, Cult is similar in terms of ridiculousness to the conclusion of Occult, except that it lasts for a full hour and a half instead of just a minute or two. Of course, this isn't to say that Cult is completely without merit. It's refreshing to see Shiraishi mix up his formula, and try on some new tones and visuals for a change. It definitely won't be for everyone who loved Noroi and Occult, but Cult is certainly worth a look for anyone who's a fan of Shiraishi or other found footage projects. In addition to this, the film provides us some opportunities for further reading on several subjects. The following may help bolster one's understanding of and appreciation for Cult, though the film can of course be appreciated without the context. Spiritual possession, which we've talked about previously with projects like Itako Visions, is present within cult. Possession itself is a common occurrence among many religions, making it a trope in both Western and Eastern horror. In Japan alone, we can find discussion of possession both in Shinto, the indigenous religion of Japan, and the beliefs of the Ainu, those being the people present in Japan before the Paleolithic Jomon period. In Cult, a priest states that one of our protagonists caught a demon while watching the initial video of the haunting. The same man also claims that one of the women is more open to possession due to being close to death at one point. He goes on to warn that eating meat or fish will heighten potential for possession, all of which speak to superstitious beliefs regarding spirit possession in Japan. In Shinto lore, possession is called kamigakari, which translates as something like possession by a spirit. According to Shinto, kamigakari is not perceived as an inherently negative occurrence as it is in other traditions such as Catholicism. In fact, kamigakari is common practice, and is encouraged in certain ceremonial situations, though admittedly the film's take on possession is definitely negative. In the broader context, a yorishiro is an object selected and cordoned off for the sake of possession. As with the conditions about which the priest warned, being close to death and consuming flesh, humans can be yorishiro if certain conditions are met. Yorishiro are not alone in the possession game though. Tsukimono, that is, in Japanese, possession things, are, contrary to Yorishiro, always possessed involuntarily. Outside of the purview of Shinto, you also have yokai or other animal spirits who will possess humans for their own gain, as retribution for past wrongs, or simply for fun. There are also beings known as pretas, these being Buddhist spirits of individuals who passed on with bad karma. Pretas are supposed to be wicked in some way, wishing mainly to possess the living.
Within cult, we're presented with a handful of priests whose tactics and practices vary wildly. Two of them are what one might consider traditionalists, adhering primarily to the ceremonies and customs of their teachings. The youngest, meanwhile, is portrayed as being more or less a-religious. He's taken to using more brutal methods and less tradition in order to exercise demons. In this way, the whole group has the same aims, just different means of achieving them. In Shinto tradition, the term for exorcism is harai. It is said that harai may be used by trained priests to get rid of impure forces present in all portions of life. This can be personal, of course, for one's body or dwelling. In the case of a spirit causing illness, spirits will return again and again, meaning that recurring exorcisms are needed over time. This is not where harai ends, however, as in recent times, exorcisms have become more common in atypical subjects such as businesses and vehicles. The film also shows us some magical and religious symbols shared between Japanese mysticism and Western traditions. First up, we see a symbol which we would commonly refer to as the Star of David. This mark, a fairly basic hexagram, is known in Japan as the Kagome. It's believed by some more conspiratorial peeps that the Kagome and the Star of David appear identical due to a good old-fashioned pilgrimage. Namely, these folks think that the biblical Israelites visited Japan during their decades of wandering, or else that they were Japanese. Hey, there's a group of people who even believe that the big JC ended up in Japan at one point, though that's a story for another day. In reality, the Kagome is likely present within Japan due to its ubiquity and simplicity. Similar to the spiral or swastika, the Kagome has been around since before recorded history. This hexagram is a design which has been observed since at least the 5th century BCE, in lattice work as well as in logos and family crests. Different cultures and religions all have their own meanings for the hexagram. For example, in Hindu belief, this symbol represents the union of male and female. Here in Shinto, however, the Kagome is seen as a ward against evil spirits, which naturally fits right into the proceedings of cult. Similar to the hexagram, we also observe in cult the presence of their lesser-limbed counterparts, the pentagram. We've discussed this previously, but the pentagram seems to have just as much to do with the Japanese mystic art of Onyodo as it does Shinto. In both traditions, the pentagram is used as a symbol of harmony and balance. Within Onmyoto, this harmony is achieved, as each of the star's points represents one of the elements. This system of five elements was brought to Japan via China. In their original context, these were fire, water, wood, metal, and earth. In the Japanese five elements, meanwhile, we have earth, water, fire, wind, and the void. In addition to the other ways in which the Onmyoto and Shinto pentagrams may be interpreted, we're here interested in the symbol as another ward against evil. In this case, however, we have a more specific reason for this status. In this case, the symbol was the seal of Abe no Seime, the father of Onyoro. Supposedly, Seime used this symbol as his representation to denote the elements of the world in balance against perturbed spirits. In other words, one might see the Seiman, the name given to the symbol in Onmyoro, as a call to normalcy and balance. Lastly, in cult, we see an exploration of talismans of protection. In Japan, these talismans are known as ofuda. Each ofuda is said to symbolize an individual kami, or a divine Shinto being. The theory goes that by utilizing an ofuda, the user will channel the energy and spirit of that kami to help the individual invoking the kami. Supposedly, it is said that three ofuda ought to be placed at the family altar, one for the sun goddess Amaterasu, one for your regional shrine, and one for your ancestral shrine. Though admittedly, we couldn't find confirmation of this setup through all of our sources. These talismans are not the same as omamori, which are smaller and intended to be carried around by an individual. Omamori are intended to provide protection, luck, love, and so on. Ofuda, on the other hand, are intended to be stationary. They're pasted on a specific location and left as long-term wards for protection. With all of this in mind, one can perhaps get a bit more out of cult. Though, as we said, none of this is entirely necessary to appreciate the quirky, quaint blend of horror and comedy present within the film. With that, we'll be moving on from Koji Shiraishi's work and delving into some other horror projects we've been putting off for quite a while. Don't worry though, we've not yet seen the last of Mr. Shiraishi. Let us know in the comments below what you think of Cult, and what you think of Shiraishi in general. 
Also, let us know which of his other works you'd like to see us cover in the future, once we get back to looking at him.